open up. Oh. Did I do something wrong? Okay, okay got Okay. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers very much for inviting me to this uh, impressive conference and um, to, together with, other, with, with some of the other uh, speakers who I uh, have admired for many years. Um, I'm Tim Hatton. I've been working on asylum and refugees for about 15 years. And um, uh, the number of uh, email messages and um, inquiries I get about the, on this topic sort of goes up and down almost exactly in line with the number of asylum applications to Europe. So, so I'm in fashion at the moment for, for that reason. Um, and uh, what I want to do today is to um, talk not, not specifically about the recent migration crisis uh, as of the last, let's say, two years, but to look at some of the background leading up to it, uh, to look at some of the empirical issues that arise, and to uh, then, if I've got time at the end, I will focus on uh, what's been happening just, just very recently. So the, the sort of roadmap of this talk is that I want to talk, first of all, about the uh, determinants of asylum applications. This is something I've worked on for a long time. Uh, I want then to come to the question of how this is being received in Europe. Uh, and I want to do that through looking at public opinion and how that's changed over time. And I, do, I want to do that as a sort of background to what's feasible in terms of uh, policy change and policy innovation. Um, and I want to focus then on three specific issues which I think are related to the current policy debate. One of them is border control. We've already heard about that, some of the, uh, something about that from Doug Massey. Uh, resettlement and burden sharing, because I think these are the issues that are on the agenda. I want to take a slightly longer term look at those, and then if I've got time at the end, I will uh, talk directly about the current crisis. The bottom line from all this uh, that I want to uh, argue is that I believe that the current system of asylum applications and uh, the way we deal with asylum in Europe is inefficient. I think it fails to, um, to help those who most need our help uh, as refugees. And I think it ought to be replaced by a, uh, a substantial resettlement program. How you get to that is another matter which I'll come to uh, if I've got time later on. So let me first ch turn to looking at the long run um, I still haven't been able to operate this thing. How do I do it? Hmm? Ah, got it, okay. Right. Uh, okay, I've just about said all that. This is what I wanted to show you. So, um, on this graph, we can see what the trends have been from um, early 1980s up to 2014. This is UNHCR data. Uh, the, some of it's now available for 2015, which needs to be added on to the end of this graph. What you can see is the blue line, which is the, which is the top one, which is um, the number, the stock of refugees as measured by the UNHCR. And you can see that that uh, measured on the left scale goes from about 10 million in 1982 up to 18 million in 1992, goes down a bit to the mid-2000s, and it's gone up a bit since then, and it's going up very steeply currently. Uh, 18 million at the peak, uh, about 14 million at the end of 2014. It will be a lot higher than that at the end of 2015 when we've got that data. Uh, just to, before I move on, just to recall that uh, the, 60, the figure of 60 million um, displaced persons, which is often quoted from, the, uh, again, the UNHCR's uh, report for 2015 uh, includes a lot more people than this. 38 million of them are, um, are internally displaced, and there are all sorts of other people in there as well, stateless people, Palestinian refugees who are not in this total. Uh, so there's, there's a variety of other uh, si settings and situations which add to the, total, um, to the total humanitarian crisis. This is only part of it, and this is only people who are, have been displaced outside their country of origin. That's what refugees are, and that's following the definition of the 1951 Convention. 
Okay, so looking down the graph a bit further, we've got uh, the flow of migration of uh, asylum applications uh, to what the UNHCR calls industrialized countries. That uh, is, there's 38 countries in this, and they are most countries in Europe, Western Europe, uh, and the EU. They are Canada, Australia, uh, US, uh, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, so that's more or less it. So it's sort of the developed world, more or less the OECD. And you can see that uh, there is a long history of asylum applications with a, a big rise to a sharp peak in the early 90s, uh, which, was, um, uh, fought, which followed the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, uh, the, uh, the uh, Berlin War, the fall of the Berlin War. You can see it went down a bit after that, went up again in the early 2000s, and then fell, and now it's risen to a new, a new height. And if I had the 2015 um, reading there, it would go way off the, way off the graph, uh, 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 over sort of something like 1.8 million or something like that. So um, there have been ups and downs in the past, and one question I think which arises from this is whether or not we've seen a, a big rise in the 80s, which sort of seemed to be somewhat permanent. We never fell uh, to, to, to the low levels that were seen previously. And, one issue, I think, is whether we're now in another situation where we're going to have a big rise and then there's going to be uh, an ongoing um, uh, number, which is, uh, you can see on the right-hand scale, uh, the numbers there, which would be sort of, say, half a million or maybe even a million a year. The gray line is the applications to countries in Europe. And you can see that what's driving this graph is basically Europe. So Europe is, is really the focus of this, and it's been the kind of center of controversies about refugees for a number of years. Ah, okay. Okay, so not surprisingly, with the big steep rise in applications that we've seen, seen recently, I'm gonna focus on the determinants of those applications. And one reason for doing that is that it's awake, reawakened the debate about what's driving asylum applications. It's, uh, to, to, to put it crudely, uh, there's one, one view is that the, these are people who are driven by, um, by strife, by civil war, by human rights abuse, and all the rest of it. Another view is that they're, uh, or a proportion of them, are economic migrants. And that's become another, uh, that, that debate, it's a long, long-standing debate, has sort of uh, re-arisen in recent years. And so we do need to know something about what drives um, asylum applications. Um, sorry, I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? I okay. Uh, do you know, the reason for this is I'm holding this damn thing the wrong way around. <laughs> okay, right. So, let's come to um, um, asylum applications in Europe. So, this is the number of asylum applications over a five-year period from 2010 to 14 per thousand of the population. I just want to point out that it's very, very uneven across Europe, and that's something which... Uh, debates within the EU have focused on because countries like Sweden, Malta, Switzerland, Norway have been uh, receiving vast numbers of uh, asylum applications, whereas other countries have relatively small numbers relative to their populations. If we did this for 2015, the picture would look very different with very high numbers for countries like Germany and Austria. So, very uneven distribution of applications. The third thing I want to focus on is what happens to, um, to these uh, people who apply for asylum. Uh, most of those who apply for asylum in Europe uh, are what are sometimes known as spontaneous applicants. They're people who arrive on the border, at the border or within the border, and then apply for asylum. They come um, individually or in groups, and, uh, but not assisted or uh, particularly by any agency or other. Once they come in uh, and claim asylum, their asylum claim is then uh, adjudicated. And uh, one of the things that, that uh, this shows is what proportion of those claims result in, a, uh, in some refugee status being granted. Now, there are two lines here. One is um, for refugee status being granted under the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, uh, in a sort of full refugee status, and the other is for those convention refugees plus others that are granted some form of humanitarian visa. 
humanitarian visas or subsidiary protection or something like that, uh, often in circumstances when the person has some um, claim to uh, have been persecuted, um, but, in, but in any case can't be returned to the country from which they came. So that's, um, that, that's what these numbers are. And what you can see here is that uh, for most of the period, up to from the sort of late 80s up to 2012, the proportion of applicants that are successful is actually quite small, it's about a third. Um, it would be a bit higher if we take into account um, uh, appeals, be five or 10 percentage points higher, but it's still the case that, and it's not true in the last couple of years when it's come, reached about 50%, but it's, it, on the whole, what's happened is that less than half of the people who've claimed asylum have been uh, having gone through this process, being granted asylum. They are people who have been asked uh, to uh, return to their country, uh, either voluntarily uh, or with assistance, or have been forced to return. Many of them don't do that and end up in the sort of underground economy, and we've seen that in, in many uh, European countries. And that's, that's one of the sort of key features, I think, of this asylum migration. Many people don't get asylum. Okay. So let me turn then to the determinants of asylum applications. Now, I've done some work on this over the years, and the, the database, I'm not going to show you the regressions, you'll be relieved to know, but uh, I'm just going to describe what the results are, but just to give you what the setup is, there are 19 destination countries. These are the countries that receive about 85% uh, of all those applications that go to, quotes, industrialized countries. Uh, they are 14 countries in the EU, that is excluding Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, Norway, US, Canada, Australia. Uh, and the origin countries I've uh, taken are 48 strife-prone origin countries. Um, you may say, well, it depends really about when you, what the timing is, which countries you want to choose. But actually, there's an amazing sort of continuity in the, con the sources of asylum applications. So, for example, if you took, took the top 20 um, countries in terms of applications in 2010 to 14, uh, of, the, of that 20, 15 would be in the top 30 in 1990 to 94, in other words, 20 years earlier. There's huge continuity in the set of countries that are... Uh, that, that generate asylum applications. And so I focus on uh, 48 of those. The setup is these are, these are uh, regressions with, uh, so that, that there's, a, there's a, uh, destinations, there's origin countries, and there's a time dimension. And this is annual data from 1997 to 2014. This is done with origin, destination, dyad, fixed effects, for those of you who are interested in these sorts of things. The bottom lines are these. Uh, when we introduce variables that capture the uh, extent of war, terror, human rights abuse in countries, uh, in origin countries, they're the most important variables that drive asylum applications. That ought not to be a great surprise. In fact, we, we would be very surprised if it was other than that. The key variables seem to be uh, for example, the, the uh, political terror scale, which is a, a well-known um, measure of uh, human rights abuse, and the Freedom House Index of Civil Rights. Those two things are the ones that seem to matter most. Civil wars of themselves don't matter all that much, except in the last few years. Civil war seems to be, have become more important as a driver of asylum applications in just in the last few years, specifically since 2011. So those are the key things. Now, what about economic variables? Because we want to address this question about are people pulled or pushed by economic uh, uh, developments? One of the things that we do find in this uh, exercise is that uh, living standards in origin countries matter. O origin country GDP per capita is negative related to the number of applications. That is, if, um, uh, applica if, if GDP in a source country went up by 10%, asylum applications were fall by about 5%. That's my estimate. So it's not huge, but it is there. Um, so those are the, 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 the sort of main findings. However, there's one other thing which I've uh, sought to do over the years, and that is to try and capture the effects of asylum policies. And I want to spend a little bit of time just discussing that. Um, 
what I've done is to develop a five a 15 component index of policy. I'm not going to show you the policy index now, but I'll show you some of the results of it in a minute. You can divide these types of policies, and let me, let me say right away, this is a very crude indicator of policy. The kind of style of it is that uh, it ticks up by one unit if there is a major change in policy, which is to the detriment of uh, uh, refugees or asylum seekers, okay? So it's, uh, uh, the index goes up as policy gets tougher. So it doesn't include all, uh, all conceivable um, policy measures, um, but it does include three sort of key, what I think are key components of asylum policies. One is policies that are aimed at uh, limiting access to the country's territory. Now, in, you used to be able to, decades ago, apply for application, apply for asylum at a embassy or consulate of a particular country that you wanted to apply to. That's really no longer possible. And so you have to get onto the territory or you have to arrive at the border. There's no other way to, um, to claim asylum. And so, not surprisingly, countries have uh, sought to try and reduce the, po the the possibilities for people to arrive at the border and then claim asylum. They've done that through various uh, measures of controlling the borders more, uh, policing the borders more, more stringently, imposing visa restrictions, carrier sanctions, and so on. There are five sort of components to this, uh, and I, when I put the, that index into, the, into this uh, regression setup, I find that uh, these... Um, uh, tight, measures of tightening have strong negative effects on the number of applications. The second type of policy is policies that determine sort of whether or not you get uh, asylum status, uh, refugee status. So how we, how, we, uh, how we implement the definition of a refugee, whether some uh, particular claims or claims from some countries are uh, defined as manifestly unfounded. There's a whole range of uh, elements of this uh, refugee determine, uh, this, this uh, status determination process. And when I in include an index for that, I find that that too is a very negative effect on asylum applications. A third sort of cluster, if you like, of policies is how we treat people who uh, while their applications are being processed, and remember that um, sometimes this is a very long process. It used to take uh, years in, in many cases. They've uh, shortened the process quite a bit now, but still there are people uh, who, whose claims are being processed for quite a long period, like six months, for example. So I've looked at whether, the, whether people receive welfare, welfare benefits, whether they're dispersed across the country, whether they're placed in detention, and things like that. That has no effect at all. What's the interpretation of this? Well, my interpretation of it is that what's really driving uh, asylum applicants is the chance of gaining per, uh, permanent settlement in the country. They've already gone through hell and high water to get to the border, and so further privations are not going to affect them very much. What really does matter is whether they're going to get uh, refugee, some form of refugee status and how they can get to the border. Those are the key things, I think. Here's uh, a, um, a table showing what my estimates are of the effect in terms of percentage changes in annual asylum applications of changes in policy uh, over two periods, from 1997 to 2005 and from 2005 to 2014. And you can see that um, policy got uh, very much tougher between the late 90s and the early 2000s. And that's reflected in the enormous drops in asylum applications that can be seen in these numbers here. You can see it in the data as well. You can see it in the raw data, which I showed you earlier on. A lot of this is, is to do with uh, tougher policies. Now, if you estimate, uh, as I've done before, the, um, the pr proportion of the fall from the peak of 2002 down to 2005 or 2006 that is due to policy, it's about one-third. So it's not everything, by any means, because these other variables that I described earlier are also extremely important. You can see there's great policy variation as well between countries. If we look at uh, the period after 2005, when 
when policy on average doesn't get very much tighter, some countries uh, become more, quote, generous, other countries become more restrictive. Uh, you can see, again, a, a huge variety of effects. And you can see one in particular, which is Sweden, 127% increase due to policy between 2005 and 2014. So those are the effects I've got from these simple policy dummy variables. I'm not saying this is exactly what our policy effect, this is the best I can do, and I'm encouraging other people to come up with better indices of policy. But I think it's enough to convince, I hope convince you that policy has been effective in reducing asylum claims, and that is what these policies have been aimed at doing. Okay, so I want to shift now to another topic, which is looking at uh, the way these things have been received in European countries, and in particular in public opinion. The reason for this is that if we're concerned with policy and development of policy, governments in, uh, in democracies are elected, and they have to Pay, pay heed to the people who elect them. So what those people think is going to matter for how policy can be shaped. And what I'm going to argue is that there are three things that uh, I think we should pay attention to when we're thinking about how to frame um, asylum policies. So the first is um, I'm going to look at um, the European Social Survey. Now, this was a survey conducted every two years across Europe. It's a very good quality survey. Cormac's going to tell you more about it later on. In 2012 and 2014, there were specific modules on opinion uh, towards uh, uh, on immigration. There are some questions in every wave as well. But I want to focus uh, at the moment on these uh, three questions. So first of all, um, I won't read them out, but one relates to um, people from a different race or ethnic group. And what do we think about that, uh, admitting people like that? Secondly, about admitting people from poorer countries outside Europe. And thirdly, uh, should we be generous in judging asylum applications? Now, what I've done with these is to code anti-immigration as being few, none, in the, these first two cases, and disagree or strongly disagree in the, in the third case. If you look at those, um, those trends in those numbers, and I'm not going to show you the actual data, um, opinions become a little bit more positive towards ethnic minority immigrants over this 12-year period and more negative to immigrants from poor countries. But it has become much more positive towards uh, genuine refugees by about 15 percentage points. If we look at the, I mean, I've got 14 countries here. We now have uh, a few more because the ESS rolls this out uh, in stages. But if you look at the correlation between the asylum flow, flow of applications in the five years before the survey was undertaken in uh, 2000, up to 2002 and up to 2014 and correlate those changes with uh, opinion, what you find is that the rise in asylum applications is having strong positive correlation with negative attitudes towards people of different ethnicities, a positive correlation between people, uh, between changes in applications and people, uh, opinion on people from poor countries, and a slightly negative uh, um, uh, correlation with attitudes towards genuine refugees. So, that's one, one thing about um, uh, our attitudes to refugees, which have been becoming much more positive over the last 12 years by something like 15 percentage points. That's the first thing. Second thing is that there is a large literature that analyzes uh, public opinion and uh, public opinion towards immigration and laterally towards asylum. And it, it uses variables like the ones I've just shown you uh, from the ESS. Now, what these variables do is they tell you um, what people's preferences are. Would you like more? Would you like less? A bit more, a bit less? That's what it's about. It does not tell you how strongly people feel about that. That's salience, not preference. So I'm calling the first thing preference. The second thing is salience. And um, one way of measuring salience is to look in the Eurobarometer survey to see uh, their responses to the question, do you, what do you think are the two most important issues facing our country at the moment? It's issues, not problems. It's just a question of what the key you know, issues are 
political issues are that we should be worrying about. Uh, I code that one if uh, immigration is chosen from one of the 14 alternatives that are offered. The reason this is um, important is that what, the one, one way of thinking of salience is that it, if you have a loss function which multiplies preference and salience together, what salience is doing is sort of magnifying the effect of positive or negative views uh, about a particular issue. Here is uh, what the numbers look like. This is from Eurobarometer. And you can see that um, salience was quite high in some countries in about in 2007. It, it fell with the recession because other things became more important, in particular unemployment, the economic crisis. And you can see it's gradually increased. It varies a lot from country to country. But you can see it's now reached a, sort of an all-time high. So salience is now very high. It's not that people are massively anti-immigration. It is that immigration is now seen as a much more important issue than it used to be. OK. Um, third thing, attitudes towards um, illegal immigration. Now, as I've said, salience increases the impact of, of the political impact of anti-immigration preference. And the, the, these are not particularly high. Um, the numbers are on there for you to see. But so why, why, why is there so much uh, feeling of backlash against uh, recent uh, immigration trends? Well, uh, one of the reasons is that this has been overwhelmingly uh, immigrants who've arrived illegally on the borders or in the countries, as I've said earlier. If you look at transatlantic trends, as another survey, uh, negative attitudes towards illegal immigration are double what they are towards um, legal immigration. 75% of people in 2013 are, uh, believe that more measures should be taken against uh, illegal immigration. In the Eurobarometer, the number is even higher. And I think one of the things about this is that the effect of, of salience is to, is to basically magnify each end of the distribution. Preferences don't change all that much, but they're, once they're magnified by salience, we can see that that's feeding sort of uh, the extreme right, for example, on one side. And it's also actually uh, uh, become a sort of positive uh, stimulus to people who uh, are on the left or who are interested in refugees and so on. Or, so it, it's caused this, uh, I think, uh, increased diversity of political opinion. Level of decision making. Um, you might think that with the Euro crisis and all, and all the uh, difficulties that the European Union has faced over the last decade, that people will be increasingly against having immigration and asylum policies set at the EU level. In fact, they've become increasingly positive about that. Support for joint European immigration policy is, according to the latest Eurobarometer survey, 70% on average. I should say that's a uh, joint um, policy by the European Union or the European Union and the, the government of the country concerned. What that suggests is that the EU has a much greater mandate for uh, setting asylum policies than a lot of people uh, previously thought. Okay, here's the summary so far. I'm not going to read it out, but I want to draw on these uh, basic points to think about three issues which I think are now facing us in uh, asylum policies. So they're basically how many, no, let me not, I won't repeat all that because my time's running out, isn't it? So I better get, how many, how many minutes? Five minutes, okay, so I really need to get on. Border control. Um, in the paper I've written, uh, which you're welcome to look at, um, I discuss border controls and in particular a couple of experiences which I think support the empirical analysis that I showed you earlier on, which is that we can stop these things if we, uh, if we make the effort. Spain did it uh, around the, uh, the Western Mediterranean in the uh, early to mid 2000s until the collapse of, Sy of Syria and uh, of, excuse me, of uh, Libya uh, opened the borders again. Um, and perhaps a, another good example is, is Australia, which has pretty much stopped uh, the boats twice um, and from 
a very tough policy introduced in 2001, a relaxation of that policy. Uh, a maritime arrival started increasing, a toughen policy as well, they stopped uh, in 2013. So there is evidence to suggest that um, this, this can be done, but it has to be fairly draconian and it has to be achieved in cooperation with transit countries, if at all possible. I think what the EU um, experience illustrates is, is simply the failure to do this. Uh, to um, Mrs. Merkel's gesture, uh, people arriving uh, at the Greek border, we've been um, uh, basically not operating border controls on many parts of the Mediterranean. And I think we need to tighten that up. If we do that, then what that means is that we shall filter out a lot of people who are uh, not genuine uh, uh, refugees, but also a lot of genuine refugees. And so we need another policy to help those people. The, those are the people that, we, that our uh, asylum and refugees policy should be helping, and there are people who are marooned in refugee camps, many of whom are vulnerable people. They're women and children. They're facing um, privation and violence. They're the people we should be helping, not the people who've got the, the wherewithal and the get up and go to, uh, to get on a boat to Greece or Italy. Our efforts at resettlement are, are pretty dismal. Um, about 80,000 refugees are resettled each year. Most of them go to uh, the US, Australia, Canada. The, U, the EU resettles about uh, 10,000, not very many. Um, and what we need to do is to um, upgrade our efforts on that. The UNHCR's, as of 2015, estimate of the number of refugees they have uh, identified in countries of uh, first asylum as in need of resettlement is 1.15 million. And of course, we know there's another uh, 13 or 14 million who, uh, whose claims need to be thought about. Uh, the, the EU has been, has been promoting resettlement in recent years, but it's hard to convince countries to engage in a major resettlement program when they're facing large numbers of spontaneous applications from asylum applicants who are coming in uh, on boats and uh, through, other, through other means. So we're not going to get resettlement going until we've uh, addressed the, the current issue, in my view. In order to um, have a substantial resettlement program, one which is many times greater than the one that's currently, uh, uh, that, that's currently on, on, on the agenda, is that we need to have more burden sharing among countries. I showed you the huge inequality in the number of asylum applications to different countries. And you can see the same thing in the stock of, uh, of refugees in those countries. Um, one reason for burden sharing is that uh, if we think of that hosting refugees satisfies basic humanitarian motives, then we can consider hosting refugees as being a public good. And if a public good is supplied locally by one country, and every country does the same thing, it will be underprovided. That's a standard result in public economics. So there is a need for coordination and cooperation in order to ensure that the best outcome is achieved not just for the refugees, but for the people who are hosting them. What the, co the, the common asylum policy has done is it's focused on harmonization. That is, you know, setting the same price or the same, hur same height of hurdle for everybody. Um, and that's led to, if anything, a uh, more, uh, di greater dispersion of applications and refugees than would otherwise be in the case. The Dublin regulation, which I think is absolutely hopeless, has only uh, made that uh, worse. Um, so, I think we have to uh, think very seriously about an uh, EU-led and EU-wide um, burden-sharing program attached to resettlement, not just to uh, asylum, spontaneous asylum applications. So here are my conclusions. The existing uh, asylum system, I believe, is inefficient, it's ba badly targeted, and it fails to focus on those who most need our help. We can do better in the EU by, first of all, tightening the borders, secondly, resettling vastly more of those in the greatest need,
And thirdly, expanding our capacity for resettlement through burden sharing. And one point about this, I think, is that any policy that we try and, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to pursue in the EU has to be politically feasible. My argument is that these measures will work with the grain of public opinion and not against the grain of public opinion as we are currently doing. Otherwise, we risk, and we have already seen, uh, a backlash which could grow um, even greater than, than it is. I believe this would be a constructive way of developing EU as, uh, asylum policy in the longer term, but it would really only go a modest way to addressing the uh, hardships and the misery of what are uh, a total displaced population of 60 million. Thank you.